Hello, Streakers. Jamie and I are looking forward to, to and have been excited to have this guest on our show today. Our guest is a writer, speaker, and educator, and connector. She's been published in the Washington Post, the Deseret News, and a host of other online publications where her pieces have been read by millions of times. She has dedicated her life to strengthening families and nurturing meaningful relationships with genuine compassion and practical wisdom. Our guest empowers individuals to thrive in their personal connections, offering valuable insights that resonate deeply with audiences worldwide. Her work revolves around inspiring and equipping individuals to navigate the complexities of familial bonds. Through her guidance from self-care for moms to raising toddlers and teens, she provides invaluable support and encouragement on raising a family. As a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, her strong faith infuses her work with purpose and a divine perspective, inspiring audiences to embrace the profound importance of faith in their own lives. Without further ado, let's welcome to the Streaking Podcast, Brooke Romney, and let's start streaking. Brooke, we are well, so you. excited you to bet. have you on. Thank you. What an incredible introduction. I'm going to have you write for me from now on. <laughs> Love that, to. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> we have been just looking forward to this podcast for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I wanted to start off by just asking you a little bit about your family and then kind of how you got started on the project. One of your one of the books that you've written that are my favorites are you have the 52 Manners books and you have a 52 Manners for Modern Day Teens, Volume 1, Volume 2. And then you have a third book coming out that's a similar format for kids. And I just wanted to hear kind of how the genesis of how that came about and, and how you got it started. Well, I am really, really passionate about helping teens live their best lives. And I feel like, especially with COVID, there just was a real downturn, a little gap, but I think it started even before then when we started introducing smartphones to teenagers. And I think we didn't know what would happen and we're seeing a lot of what happened. And a lot of that is a decreased amount of connection and awareness um, struggle with relationships, social norms. And what I saw was that teens who got those things, who understood those things, whether they were taught from parents or some kids are just, they're lucky. They just have it inside of them. Um, some, some types of religion maybe helps with that, with the connections. But I just noticed that those teens who got it were doing well while other teens were really floundering. And I thought, is there a simple way, a simple, inexpensive way to help parents connect with their teens? A lot of parents are like, I don't even know what to do. And I think even before cell phones, parents were intimidated by the teen years, but add in cell phones and distractions for both teens and parents, and they weren't quite sure how to connect. So I thought, is there a simple way we can help parents connect to their kids, help teens understand social norms? And both of those things, I think, will make teens more successful and connected and feeling like they just have the confidence that they need. And so those were really important to me. And as I kind of opened it up to my community and thought about it myself and talked to people online and in person, I felt like a book that would be kind of a flip book, a stand up book that was easy to digest, that gave really practical advice that was usable was the way to go. And I think, you know, I've noticed that a lot of families agree it's been really awesome. That is totally, I agree with you completely because <laughs> I've loved it. And we were talking, I, I feel a little selfish because we have several people on our team, um, our streaking team that would have loved to be on this podcast today and be able to talk to you. But we were talking a little bit about um, the, the, the manners book. And one of my friends who's on the team said, you know, originally I wanted to do it something where it was every single week we talked about a different manner. She said, but what I found has worked so well is she goes, I just put it on our kitchen table and I just change it. And she said, it just creates these natural opportunities to talk about things. And, and I loved that part of it because like you had mentioned that, that connecting and communication 
with parents and kids. So as you've, some of these ones that I've loved as I flipped through are things that people maybe wouldn't have thought about to write about. Like for example, one of my favorite ones that you have in there is be a good passenger and acknowledge that someone's giving you a ride, talk to them and, and these things. So I wanted to ask you, as you were coming up with the manners, I picture that it was just you going about your life. And you're like, oh, I need to think about that one and write that one down. But I wanted to ask you, how did you come up with the different ones that you have? Because some of them are ones that when I read, I thought, yes, that is so true. But I hadn't ever actually put it into words necessarily. And so I wanted to kind of ask you, how did you come up with some of the manners? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it was just observation from my own family. So it's funny, sometimes people will say, but your kids are so well mattered. And I'm like, well, where do you think I got all these ideas for things we were lacking, <laughs> right? So a lot of them were things that I noticed in my own kids. And then I had a lot of kids in my home, in and out of my home. I was at the middle school a lot during that time of writing the manners books. And I just noticed. So there was a lot of noticing. And then once I started sharing them online, people would come to me with other ideas um, in addition to what I already had. And I don't know if you've ever thought like, I'm thinking of buying a Ford F-150. And then all of a sudden you notice every Ford F-150, like, yes. oh, I didn't know they had one. Oh, I didn't know they had one. And so once I kind of had it in my mind that this is something that I wanted to think about and focus on, I just, I think I was hyper aware of there's a deficiency there and there's a deficiency here. And I think one of the most inspirational things too was seeing kids who did it well and noticing the different reaction I had to the kids who got in my car. My cute 11 year old has a friend who I've been giving rides to forever in different carpools. And he always gets in and he says, Hey Brooke, how was your, how's your day going? And I have such an affinity for this boy because he says that. And as I noticed my own personal reactions to kids who get it, I thought, this is something that's so simple. What if every kid got in the car and greeted the parent? Immediately, that parent is suddenly on their team, on their side. Sure, have this kid over. Yes, I'd love to give him a ride. I thought, what a more fun life for these teens to lead, full of people who enjoy and like and respect them from just really tiny things that they're doing that that takes almost no effort and it completely changes the way you feel about someone. Right. You know, as I look at that, uh, you talk about tiny things. It's a lot of what we talk about in streaking is it's the laughably small things that make the big difference. I remember living in Georgia. We lived in Georgia for quite a time. And many of the young men and young women that were there would greet us with a yes, sir, or a hello, ma'am, or how are you, sir? And it was it was part of that culture. And I remember when we moved down there, how refreshing it was and how neat yeah. it was to have them to have them uh react in that way and it was great because it, it would always be miss jamie or mr jeffrey yeah which was a fun combination of a use of our first name with this also a, a sign of respect and yeah. i really grew to love that when we left the first time we went somewhere and someone didn't say miss jamie i was like hey <laughs> miss jamie where's where's the miss that was and it. so that just that yeah that sign yeah. of respect is yeah. awesome well and i love i love the tie in with what you do because i think we often think these small things aren't going to matter they're not going to yeah. be life changing they're not going to put me on a different trajectory but i think kids are starting to understand just by these tiny little manners you know doing something as small as saying thank you when you leave a home instead of walking by a parent. It's like, well, sure, they can come anytime. Or um, being someone who celebrates others, while that's like a little, that's a little bigger and something you have to grow into and kind of make a habit. Celebrating others, all of a sudden people wanna be around you. They wanna tell you about good things that are happening. They wanna connect with you. So I love the tie-in with streaking and how just small, very, very small things can really end up changing lives. Yeah, absolutely. I have a, as you were talking, my, my thoughts were going to what led you into this course? I mean, as you got going in, I mean, you were a writer for a long time and those things, did you, did you always have a passion for writing and then you kind of got into family or was that always there or how did you get into this course? Yeah, that is a great question because I think everyone's path is so interesting because it's rarely linear. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so I always liked writing. It was something that I enjoyed doing. I majored in English. Um, My first couple jobs were writing jobs. And then I got really lucky um, after I had a couple kids and we lived in Arizona at the time I was staying home with them. And a friend had been writing an article for a newspaper, Arizona Republic, just once once a week. And she said, I don't want to do this anymore. Would you be interested? And I honestly thought, well, I'm not qualified. Like I've never written for a newspaper. Um, I've mostly done like quality assurance things or like persuasive writing. Um, And I just thought, well, I'm not qualified for that. But I thought, why not? And so I went in and interviewed. Um, I was passionate about motherhood and telling good stories about motherhood. And he gave me the job. He took a chance on me. And I'm so grateful for that because of that, I started, you know, I wrote for magazines here and there and gained the confidence when we moved to Michigan to start a little blog. Um, I was always more comfortable writing about other people, telling people about things they might be excited about. I'd never written about me or my experiences. Um, So when we moved to Utah, I had to transition because other people were doing a really good job at sharing cool places to go and traditions with their family. So I kind of had to pivot and started writing a little bit more about parenting and things that were personal. And that was not an easy change for me. Um, But I've definitely grown a thicker skin in the last 10 years and it's been really rewarding, so. Interesting you should say that it's not an easy thing because when you start to write about your experiences being a parent, I mean, Jamie and I, we have seven children and you start to share about your experience. People have a lot of opinion about what they think is the right thing and what they, I mean, so you said developing that thicker skin. I mean, that had to be a, a process to be like, it's okay. We all have opinions here and we can all share them. What, what was your process and how did you come overcome that? I had to start realizing that the message was more important than my ego. And as soon as I realized that, I was able to take criticism a lot better. And I also, as I started taking things less personally, I was able to read other people's comments and hear other ideas and other sides of things. And I think that's something that's been a huge blessing in my writing because now as a writer, I share things that work for me, but I also, um, I also am comfortable sharing mistakes, things I wish I would have done differently. Um, I do a, like a little ask Brooke once a month. And it's one of my favorite things that I do because a parent will send in a situation And then they'll ask for opinions. And one of the things I say, because I thoroughly believe this, is things work different for every family. And I have four kids and things have worked so differently for each one. And I'm so open to the idea that this tradition is awesome for us and it won't work for you. This way of dealing with a boyfriend or a girlfriend worked for us and it won't work for you. And as I learn more from other parents and families, I'm also more equipped for my next child or a different way of thinking or ways that my mind could be open to see things differently. So while I write from the point of someone who's had experiences and may be an expert in understanding different ways of thinking and putting it out there in a really digestible way, I have been also a huge learner. So I'm on the forefront of people's ideas, experiences, and opinions And I think that's only made me better at communicating mine. Yeah. I think about what you said as far as it may not work for you. It worked for me. I even think about that between our children. It didn't work for this child, but it will work for that child. And it didn't work for that child, but it'll work for that one. Totally. And as I, because I had the exact same thought and I thought, okay, the thing that you're doing that's amazing though, is giving people ideas to start with and some of them may work for their family but even if the idea doesn't work for their family you're starting an opportunity for dialogue with their kids or with their spouse with the other person that's helping them raise their kids which i think is such a huge component in the modern way of parenting because there isn't necessarily any specific one way to do it anymore it's a lot of understanding your kids and and working with them Although one of the things that I did love about the manners book is that I do love that it comes out and and says, you need to do this. (laughs) This is helpful. So, so in that regard, it's kind of a combination of both of recognizing that there are things out there that it's like, look, 
This has worked for a long time and it's still true. It still works. Looking people in the eye is still important. Being able to be present is still important, even though a lot in our world has changed digitally. But I also love that a huge component of that is being able to have open communication to understand, okay, but how are the nuances going to work with this particular child? Or what are you feeling that we need to understand so that we're addressing the right situation? I, that's actually one of my favorite things. So when it comes to the manners books, I've had almost zero pushback from people who say this manner doesn't work, or I don't believe in this one. There's been a couple which like you said, it's an awesome time to talk about your own family's values. And, you know, maybe, you know, there's a few cultural things that maybe like in a certain culture, you don't want to contribute as a guest. That's offensive. It's a great time to talk about that when the manner contribute as a guest comes up. Um, but that is probably one of the most incredible things with as many people as have bought the book, with as many people that are reading the manners online, there's very few pushback because it is nice to know that there are things that are truths yes. right now yes. and how you interpret those and how serious you are about them is different. And there's a million exceptions to every rule, depending on your situation and your kids and all those things. I think what people do is they look to those things as ideals and things that we work toward. And one of the things that I make sure that people understand is as I put these manners out, this is not a way for us to judge other people or other people's children. This is a way for us to better ourselves and give our kids the tools to be them, be their best selves. Yeah. And so sometimes people will get a little testy about, well, you don't, you know, one of them is um, like, keep your phone on silent. And somebody says, you know, I have an autistic daughter who if, if she can't watch the phone, she's ruining everybody else's experience. And I was like, that's a great exception to the rule. And right. nobody's judging that. This is all about who we are, what we're teaching our kids and how we can do that in a really effective way. Yeah, definitely. Right. So that leads us into a, a great question. What are some of your, I, I hesitate to use the word favorite manners, but what are some of the ones that stick out to you that that were and share most with us? Most passionate yeah, about, most yeah. Pa maybe passionate about, but that, and how, what was the experience that led to it, that led to writing that manner? Well, one of the most significant manners in the first book has been find new friends. Mm -hmm. I have had countless, countless messages about the way this manner opened up really important conversations, especially with boys who aren't all that interested in talking about friendship sometimes with their parents. And those have been really moving to me. And the fact that one little piece of paper can open up a teenage boy's heart and say like, mom, my friends are so mean to me. And I was just talking to a mom recently and they read this manner at the end of a school year. And he came to her in tears and said, my friends are so mean to me. And she said, okay, like, what do you want to do about this? And one of the parts of that manner is you might be alone for a little while. And so he had a lonely summer and when school started, he was able to make new friends and it's completely changed the rest of his high school. So that one has a little soft spot in my heart because of all of the experiences that have come from that one. Um, a few others that just come to mind off the top of my head. One of them is not putting down what other people love. This is something that kids do and, and adults do. I actually have found myself having to check myself ever since I created that manner. It's so easy <laughs> yeah. when somebody is like, I love this restaurant. And you're like, you do? Ooh, like I hate that restaurant. Like it's just an easy reaction. And sometimes you feel like it's connective, but it actually creates distance between you and the person you're trying to create a relationship with. I see it a ton in kids and in teens where they say, oh, what do you do? I play baseball. Oh, I hate baseball. Why do you play baseball? That's the worst sport ever. And, and you think of what that does to oh, a yeah. child trying to create a relationship and it just creates distance. So I feel really passionately about that one. Um, another one is the first manner in the first book is introduce yourself mm -hmm. because I think that manner takes us all the way through our lives. If you're comfortable being somebody that says, my name's Brooke, I haven't met you yet. Like what's your name? And, and that, creates so many opportunities for relationships. Um, 
Another one is to acknowledge adults. We would have kids hang out in our house all night. We would be sitting on the couch as they left and they would literally just walk out the door. And um, that one was something that really bothered me because we're not that scary and we're right there. And so just to say like, thanks for having me. Um, and that is a product of cell phone culture where parents just text their kids and say, I'm here and they just leave and go out instead of parents ringing the doorbell and saying, I'm here to pick up so-and-so. Right. Um, I honestly, like, I feel passionate about almost every All single <laughs> manner because I feel like they are life-changing when they put them into practice. So, and they, and they're, they're these skills that genuinely help them become better people. As you were talking about the friendship All of us one, become yeah, better people. I exactly. mean, that's kind of the cool, that's the thing that I've really enjoyed about it is reading through the manners as well and thinking, you know what, I need to do a little better. Exactly. That. Yes, me too. Yeah. yeah. As you were talking about the friendship one, one of the things that I also love that I think is great is when you write, you may have to find new friends and you may be alone for a time. It takes away this feeling that maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe, you know, I should have more friends. I should, and it, and it validates something that's in print that's going out to the world communicates you're not alone in this and being alone for a little while may be kind of normal. Like maybe yeah. this is a normal thing that a lot of people go through, yeah. which really is empowering, I think, for all of us and good reminders for those of us that have gone through it before and completely, I think, educational and, and mind opening for teenagers who are going through it for the first time to recognize oh. that it's like, okay, it's okay to be alone. I've been given permission that this isn't because nobody's ever going to like me ever again. It's more like, no, yes. this is just part of the process and, and, and you're going to get better because of it. That brings up one of the parents' favorite manners in the first book is the way you smell matters. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that was one of my favorites because I just had, I literally just had this discussion with one of my teenage boys. And, and I loved that you said it's so showering every day is non-negotiable and maybe more than once a day if necessary. Cause I literally just had that discussion. Well, and like when you talked about not being alone, that was another, like, that was another reason why I wanted to write this book is because I think when parents correct their teens, they feel like it's very personal and that it's rude and it's just all about them and their parent not liking them or not approving of them. And these books put it out there like, this is just normal. Every teen does this. Every teen smells. Every fifth grader Every has to wear deodorant. You know, this isn't me being rude to you. And that was something that I found in my house that was really hard is as I was trying to teach my kids things, a lot of times it was coming at a point where things were going wrong. And so it did feel a little personal, yeah, right? I would right. say, um, Hey, why didn't you look that person in the eye and shake their hand when they said, nice to meet you. And it was very personal. It was in the moment and it felt attacking, mm -hmm. but I love that these books get in front of that. And it's not right. personal. It's saying every teen smells. So these are the things you have to do. Every teen struggles with finding friends. Sometimes yep. every teen at some point is going to want to leave one person out. And I don't have to be the parent that says, where's so-and-so? Why didn't you invite him? That's so rude. We read it in the manner, you know, what's right. And you're probably hopefully going to keep them on the group text instead of excluding them from the group text. So that's, it's something that I didn't necessarily see would be so important. I knew I wanted something that felt a little more neutral when I was talking to my kids, but that has been one of the main reasons why parents love it is because it allows them to have these conversations, get in front of the issue without it feeling personal and kind of ruining a relationship. If parents yeah. are constantly correcting, it can hurt relationships. And this builds relationships by doing the exact same thing that correcting yeah. would have done. Right. I recently um, started, uh, I've been studying radical candor. It's, uh, uh -huh. it's by Kim Scott. You've probably read it before. Yes. Her, her. Yeah. And I thought, and one of the things I thought as I read through the manners and I thought about that is this, there's this axis of care personally and challenge directly. And what the manners do is give you the opportunity to have that personal care. I really do care about you. And that's why I'm going to challenge you directly. And here's something that we can use as a standard to be able to talk about in a way that we can be candid with one another. I can be radically candid with you and you know that I care about you, even though sometimes it may feel a little bit personal. 
Yeah, I I think that book is incredible. And the idea of it is amazing and hard to put into practice unless everyone's on the same page. So I think this is kind of like a baby step, you know, there's even a manner in the second one that says, learn to take feedback. And I think it's yeah. crucial for us to become the people we're supposed to be. Okay. So we have to pause right here and highlight one of Jamie's streaks, which is yeah. feedback. Feedback. Ta ta because I had that exact situation where as a, as I had, I had, as a stay home mom with lots of kids, I had kind of gotten into this nice cocoon of being at home and, and I was talking to your brother-in-law and I've told this story before a couple of times on the podcast, yeah. but he was talking about a woman that he had employed that was super fantastic at her job, but she struggled to take feedback and it was holding her back. And I remember at that moment, and I think everybody has these lightning and it's interesting because we call them lightning moments or light bulb moments where it wasn't really anything amazing that was said in the conversation, but it was so like individually spoken to me that said, you need to work on that. Like you yeah. struggle to take feedback. And in a situation where I can be home a lot, I don't necessarily have to take feedback sometimes. <laughs> Does that sound right? right? Yeah. I don't have to no, put myself true. out there. And I was recognizing that, that I thought, you know what? I need to get better at taking feedback because there's so many things that are crucial part of that. And, and so I think that's great. So that's, you set a streak. I set a streak to um, seek out or evaluate feedback once a week. And I didn't want to do it every day because I, I thought, I don't know if anybody needs that kind of feedback every <laughs> right. <single> day. <laughs> but I recognized, and, and it was interesting because I thought, I don't have to get feedback every week. I just need to be able to even learn about feedback. So I got a book mm. and read about feedback and just understanding how to process it. And I think that's a little bit what you were saying and even gaining a thicker skin is recognizing yeah. some feedback is something you can look at and say, you know what, that's a really valid point and I'm going to change because of that. And yeah. other feedback you may think that is really great that you have that opinion, but it's just your opinion and I, and I don't need to change because of that. And so, but that is a skill. It's not something that comes naturally to very many people, I think. And so I love that it's so brought cool. up to teenagers to yes. say, start now thinking about feedback. Not everything that's said to you is true and learning to evaluate that, but some of this stuff is, and you do need to maybe change. <laughs> well, and I think um, a lot of times in our culture right now, it's like, take me or leave me, right? Yes. Like I am this who is the I, way am. I am. You don't Maybe like start. it, then, mm -hmm. you know, I don't need you. Um, and I think there's good points to that for people who are constantly trying to change to make other people happy. But I also think, you know, if we all just stayed stagnant, and yeah. this is a message that you guys preach so well, is being stagnant is not the way we're supposed to be living. Right. And so feedback is so crucial for that. And um, I've got fairly good at that taking, I thought got fairly good at taking feedback in my profession, but I found I was less good at that in my personal life. And when my husband and I went to some marital counseling a couple of years ago, I loved our counselor because he was so candid and he said, Brooke, you're a really nice person, but you need to get tougher. <laughs> How, if you care about your relationships, you have to be open and willing to hear what might be less ideal for the other person in the relationship. And it was, it, it was kind of like your moment. It was life changing. And I, from that day forward was like, you know what, I've got to get tougher. I've got to get a thicker skin, not just professionally, but personally. And it has been really incredible for my relationships to be able to be open enough and willing enough to entertain something that might not be ideal. Yeah. Yeah. That is so good. Absolutely. Did you have something? No, go ahead. I was just going to say. So as you've gotten going, um, one of the things that I've loved as I've read some of your um, manners is that you don't totally shun technology, but instead teach how to use it, which I think is so empowering and, and just realistic, I guess, looking at it and saying these things are here to stay and teenagers are getting smartphones and they're getting them younger and younger. Even in my own family, I look at it and I think my older kids, 
they were more in the 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 16 17 year range before they got phones and then we reduced it to 12 and now i look at it and i'm like my youngest son got a cell phone at age 10. Um, and so I've amended things that I felt I never would amend based on different changes that have happened in the environment and different things that are happening. So well, in, in our family too, because our, our youngest son, every other child had a phone and they could communicate with each other. And our youngest son was feeling left out. He wasn't he was like, part I'm of not the part of the family group. Yeah. Cast. And so we're like, you know what he needs, this is how we mainly communicate now. And yeah. so we need to get involved with that. So yeah. as you, so that was what I was going to say is what are some of the things that you've seen that have really helped people in terms of technology and working with that technology with their teenagers? Wow, that is a big Yeah, I know it's topic. a big question, huh? <laughs> um because there's so much and there's so much that works personally depending on your family. Um one of the things that I'm super grateful for are all of the options that we have today compared to what we had when my oldest was starting yeah. on a technology road. There's lots of different types of phones that give access to different things. I think people are more aware. One of the things that's really worked for us in our family is understanding the place of technology and where it belongs. Um, that it doesn't take over relationships. It's, you know, one of my favorite manners in the book that actually kids often throw their parents under the bus for is the one that says, be present. Um, if there are people in the room, they are more important than the phone in your hand. And understanding that like at its base level, I think is really helpful when it comes to technology one of the things that I think is also important is modeling as a parent what you use technology for. Yes, there are times when we're connecting with friends or getting ideas on Pinterest or things like that, but they're also useful tools. So helping our kids understand and, and then being open when you're like, hey, you're still on your phone. They're like, well, I'm on Canvas. I'm getting assignments turned in or I had to watch this on YouTube for this class. Understanding that they are tools for us to use that they shouldn't um, direct or control our lives. And that when we see that they are getting into an unhealthy spot, that we have the ability to pull back. And I love having my kids understand that I am on their side, that we're a team when it comes to their technology usage, because my goal and my husband's goal for them is to be living a real life, fulfilling life. And so if they feel like their phone is getting in the way of that, instead of helping them live their best life, then it's time to figure things out. And I don't think it matters how old you are. Like you can be 17 and say, can you put screen time on my phone again? Um, you know, things like plugging your phone in at night, not in your bedroom, study after study after study has proven that that's important. Like, and I'm okay to let them know, you know, it's like um, Jennifer Garner said, when you find a study that tells me that this is good, good for you, like I'm willing to amend my plans and my rules, but until then, like I got to go with what I know and what has been studied is right. So, right. Yeah. But exactly. I think it's hard. I think it's very personal for every family and something that I think is worth figuring out how it works well. Yeah. And again, as you're talking again, I just look at it and I think so much of it is the dialogue as you were talking, our daughter, who was in college at the time, sent us this picture. She was traveling somewhere and she was in an airport <laughs> and she sent us a picture of a row of about 20 adults um, sitting in the airport and every single one of them was on technology. And she, in the caption, she wrote, and teenagers get such a bad rap for being on their technology. <laughs> and, it, but it was an interesting thing because it was the, it was one of the first times that I, that I opened my eyes and was like, that is so true. When they're on technology, I look at it a certain way, but when I'm on technology, I kind of look at it differently. And I thought yeah. the truth is I get sucked into stuff just as much as they get sucked into stuff. It may not be the same stuff, but there is a real time warp when you're dealing with technology and and so working together as a family i think is huge looking at it and saying this is something that's a part of our society it's something that's changed a lot since i was growing up it's even changed a lot since i was raising your 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 siblings like things have changed yeah. even in the last you know five seven years and so being able to have that open dialogue and communicate 
so that kids can can sometimes come in and feel comfortable saying, hey, we're at dinner and you just checked a text message, mom. (laughs) You're like, you're right, I did. I'm sorry. That's learning to be present. I think we all need kind of that working together to recognize, oh, you're right. I need to be present right now. And and this is the right time. Well, and one of the things I love that you just said was, how you recognize how you can get sucked into scrolling and technology. And that's something that I like to use with my teenagers where I say things like, I am an educated adult with a four, like a fully formed brain who knows what she wants and knows what's good for her. And technology still traps me. Yes. This is why for you, I'm putting in boundaries. I'm putting in controls because you're not ready for that yet because I'm not ready for it yet. And as your parent, this is something that I think is really important. So we're doing one hour on gaming or you're not quite ready for social media yet. And and I think those conversations are so powerful when you come from the point where you say, I don't even have all of the control that I want to have. You know, the other day I was looking at these fitness accounts and I was, I was trying to get ideas for new workouts but I actually got off and hated everything about my body. I don't want you (laughs) to feel like that. Like your body's beautiful. It's useful. I'm, you know, so proud of the way you take care of it. It's not quite time for you to be scrolling these accounts yet. And I think, I think those are really powerful conversations when our teens realize that we are not invincible and that nothing magical happens when they turn 18 and all of a sudden they're invincible to the way people feel about them or, Trapping. Or or that they all of a sudden have all the answers. That's the other right. thing. So two of your powerful manners that came to mind as you were talking was the one to be able to have a code word that your mm-hmm. teens can send to you that means something that just your family understands what's that mean. And so I you thought, can't you can't tell our I'm code not word. telling yeah, ours. Because, because then it's like <laughs> I know I thought about that. I was like, don't tell everyone it. Everyone will know. So you can't say you can't when our have it. when our teens send us a certain thing via <laughs> yes. text, we know exactly what they're saying. But I thought how important and wonderful that is for a teenager to be able to have this backup as a parent. Because sometimes for me it's sometimes it's been like, hey If you need me to text and say it's time to come home, even though it's not, but you need me to be able to get you out of that situation, I can do that for you. Mm -hmm. Or if you need just those things where where you have that kind of private communication that says, I'm on your side, I'm here for you, and we can work through this together is so huge. Yeah. Just a little side note, something I thought about when you were talking about, um, you know, looking for the new exercise program. (laughs) If you if you if you've been playing around at all with Chat GPT, I put in the other day I want a high protein diet for the next seven days, breakfast, lunch, dinner. It was awesome. It gave me exactly what I need. So you ought to try the same thing. Just put in there and with no visuals. Yeah, no visuals. It's just it's just text. And I was just like, that's so cool. Yeah, it that's it, so it cool. is absolutely awesome. That's uh, it, did, one of the things. it did help. <laughs> so that's really cool. Got my protein shake back on the yeah. Back on track. <laughs> one of the one of the things I was thinking about also in the realm of technology is um, texting, and one of one of the areas that I've emphasized with our teenagers and just wanted to throw it out there for the conversation was this whole idea of can you continue the conversation that you start via text in other words i start a conversation via text can you continue that conversation in person and i find that as we talk about that it really helps you governor what i'm actually texting because sometimes you can be a lot more bold or a lot more stupid on texting, but if you start to think about it in a way, can you continue the conversation and what would continue the conversation so that if you're texting your friend and then you guys all of a sudden meet, can you continue that conversation on? Just, I just thought, throw it out there and thoughts on that. Yeah, so one of the manners is nothing online is private. Yes. And it says, if you would not be comfortable with your parent reading it, your principal reading it, Um, a future employer reading it, don't text it. Because I think especially some of the younger kids who get phones, it does feel private, especially like on an app like Snapchat. And it's anything can be screenshot and anything can be brought up years later and anything can be truly horrible evidence against you taken out of context. And I 
that's like, I think that's one of the most important manners just that we could teach our kids no matter what. And an interesting thought I had from you saying, can you continue this conversation went a different way. Um, so one of my boys was kind of communicating with this girl and he said, she's so fun and interesting on text, but she won't say a word when we're together. Wow. And so I thought my mind went the other way with yes. that when you just said it was, are you still able to be a human in person? Like you've got this online personality, use this online personality to develop your in-person personality. Not that you have two different people or two different sides. Like if you're funny online, go ahead and be funny in person mm -hmm. and, you know, use that, use those texting conversations as springboards to real life connection, as yes. opposed to we're just online friends. And, and I think somehow if we could kind of flip the switch with our kids and help them use what they're doing online and the skills they're learning online and the ability to communicate and connect and help them use that in person, that could be very helpful as opposed to crippling. Cause I think a lot of kids, I heard from a lot of kids at prom, you know, we've been having so many good conversations and it was so fun. And then they like, didn't have anything to say you know, when we were together. And I think in that second, in my second book, I talk a lot about conversation and here are some good conversation starters. Here's how to keep a conversation going. You know, you, you kind of throw the ball back. You know, if somebody says, what's your favorite class you answer. And then you say, what's your favorite what's class. And there's still adults that really struggle doing this and they didn't even grow up with cell phones. So this is just a skill and a manner that can be really useful regardless of your age. Yeah, you know, um, when Jamie and I started this podcast years ago, um, we were talking about it because sometimes we'll have guests and other times it will be Jamie and I will talk and we talk about the conversation as a tennis match. Mm -hmm. And you're just hitting the ball back and forth and sometimes the conversation goes to the point where you're right up at the net and you're hitting back fast and other times it's nice lobs back and forth, but you're always putting the ball in the other person's court going back and forth. And I, I thought that. about that when you when you talked about when somebody says something they like to never put down what other people like. We've talked a lot about accepting and blocking um, from a book that Jeff read actually about improvisation improv for theater. Yeah, improvisation. Mm. And yeah. that that how if you want something to continue moving forward as people watch improv, that accepting is a huge part of that, accepting what people say. And we have talked so much about oh, that so because much. it has really been eye-opening for me to recognize how often I can personally block a conversation, whether that be because I said something quickly without thinking about it, or oftentimes because I'm hiding an insecurity, something that I'm mm. nervous about that, that I'm like, oh, I don't yeah. want to go there. And so you block the conversation when, when in reality it shuts everything down. And I think that that's been awesome to be able to look at and think, how can I accept more and create more of this dialogue? So I love, again, that you're communicating that specifically with teenagers. I really appreciate, and I don't know how to say it other than like you're connecting the dots for them. There's all these mm -hmm. dots out there and you're drawing the line saying, look, when you do this, it makes people kind of feel this way try doing this and you may have completely different results in that situation. And I really appreciate, I think teenagers, all of us probably need that, but I think teenagers a lot right now, it's great to have those dots connected. Well, and I was very serious about there being a why for each manner and not just a why like in a larger sense, because there's so many of those, but I wanted them to know what was in it for them. Working with teenagers, I've realized that they are motivated by self, which is normal at their stage. Right. So when you tell them things like there's a lot of reasons for the manners, but when you say, when you do this, you will make more friends. They're like, oh, okay. I might be able to get behind that yeah. as opposed to it's important for us to have a kind world. They're not quite so bought in. But when you say, you know, like you said, when you connect the dots, like, mm -hmm. When you leave one person out, you may set yourself up for the person that's going to be the one person left out later. Yeah. But if you're somebody who's inclusive, people are going to remember that they're going to want to include you, you know? And so I think that's 
that was really important in each of my manners books that there was a portion that said what's in it for me yeah. right when was the second manners book put i think we have volume one but did oh, second one just come out or what has it been out for a little while so it came out in October. So it's okay. been out for a little while, but not super long. And a lot of families use the book for a full year before right. they're ready for the next book. And and like you said, other families, like I know some families who are just passing it and their teens are just reading the whole thing on their own. Um, there was somebody that said they require both of their kids. I'm sorry. They require their kids to read both manners books before they get a cell phone. Mm. Oh, that's That is part of... And then they still review the manners once a week, but in order for them to get a cell phone, they're like, you should know how to be a human before I give you a piece of technology. <laughs> and I was like, okay. I thought that was brilliant. So they have to read both. They have to discuss like, especially the technology manners and then any of the other ones that they felt like, and they, they're really using it as a tool, um, which I love, but I think there's a lot of ways to do it. But yes, the second one came out in October and is, is still available at online so and yeah, then right. when does the one um manners for kids come out oh i am so happy you asked because i am so excited about this um that one should be out in the summer we're shooting for the first week of august you guys know how book publishing yes. goes yes, so we do <laughs> we're hoping it's the first week of august but the thing that i love about this one because we're writing for a different audience and so many parents loved the teen one but then said, I want to start this earlier. Yeah. And they're using the teen one and it's working pretty well for kids that are like nine and up, but any younger than that, there's just a little bit of a disconnect and they're not quite as relevant. And so um, this one is so fun because it targets those kids ages four to 12. And then um, it still has a really simple manner with a little explanation, but on the back, and then we have a very small why, like a really short, simple why. And then on the back, there is a portion that says, let's practice. And it gives like five different scenarios that you can role play or talk about. And I'm so excited about this because my kids were so much better young yes. role playing ideas. So one of them is like, I can't remember what the exact matter is, but it talks about making sure that we use kind words. And so it says, we have a thousand thoughts every day. Some of them are kind, some of them are unkind, and some of them are neutral. It kind of goes on to explain that just a little bit. But then on the back, it says, you see a mom at the store with a big belly. What do you do? Because those are situations that yes. as moms, we've all been in. And so much better to get in front of that and help them realize like, that's a totally okay thought to have. Right. That's okay. We all have thoughts. That's not, you're not a mean person for having that thought. But that's something that we're not going to ask if she has a baby in her tummy. We're not going to ask that, you know, and you can kind of go through those scenarios or you visit your grandpa and he smells kind of funny today. You know, what do you do? And we say, you know, grandpa's getting old and sometimes that's okay if he smells a little different, but we're not going to bring that up to him because that can hurt his feelings. Okay. So I'm so excited about not just the manners, but the format. And I love the idea of just like a whole generation starting early and then moving on to these teen manners. And I get so excited to think of what types of adults these kids are going to be. And I yes. think they're going to be really powerful and also really successful and have a lot of confidence because they're moving through life in a really incredible way. And becoming so, more self-aware at the same time that they're becoming more others aware. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, both important. Go ahead. Sorry, yeah. I was just thinking as you were saying those things like the big tummy and the smell, I'm like, hey, I probably need to have manners for men because I probably would say all those things. <laughs> right? We're going to get like, so Okay, kids better, and though. men. You I know. You, you know don't. what? You know what, honey? Don't ask if she's pregnant. Just don't <laughs> yeah. do that. <laughs> you only have to do it once, once before you never do it again. Before you yeah. go. Don't <laughs> yeah. ever, like, ever do that again. I, I think that'd yeah. be a, a good one. Manners for men. So once you get done with manners for kids, manners for men, manners for women, I think that'd be awesome. You know what? We're actually working with right now on one for adults and I I'm love super it. excited about it yes. because one of the things that I found is a lot of young adults could use these but they're not all that interested in a teen book they think they're past that yeah and then you guys know 
I mean, if you're anything like me, I'm reminded every time we flip that manner of how I can be a little bit better. I wrote the book and I do not do the book always, right? Like there's things that I need to be reminded of too. So we want to work on one, we're working on one that will work for adults and will be a little bit more general that anyone can use. As we look at just a Streakers, as you're listening to this conversation with Brooke Romney, one of the things to think about is, Brooke, you mentioned the why behind the manner and what the manner is. Oftentimes we talk about streaking being the how you do this. And Mm -hmm. what you can do with her books is set a streak to review at least one manner once a week. I mean, it's set up that way. Mm -hmm. You can even go more often if you'd like, you know, review a manner at least once a day. What that will then do is give you the foundation, the floor on which to stand in order to start conversations and to have good uh, conversations with your teens. And as a family, I I, I envision this. This is one of the things at family dinner we taught. We'll pull one of these out Mm -hmm. and talk about it. Um, It's really great to be able to be conscious and intentional about it. That's the other thing we talk about with streaking is being very intentional and deliberate in what you're doing so that you're not doing the natural tendency automatic thing that comes to your brain. Like for example, wow, that person's really large and just saying it. It's it's more along the lines of, you know what, I'm intentional and deliberate in my thoughts and I am going to continue to do that. So set a streak at least once a week, review one of these managers. Got to get the two books first, but we're we're coming on the end of our time with you, which we have thoroughly enjoyed. Did you have a last I just question? wanted to say with this with the setting of the streak, the thing that I that I've loved about it is that it helps me to remember when I have something important that I want to add into my life. When I set a streak around it, it doesn't get pushed off the plate because something else came up or because I got busy. It keeps me doing it consistently. Wow, that's really good. I hadn't thought of it in that way. That's why that's one of the things that I've loved about it. That's why and when we talk about my feedback streak, that's where that really opened up to me because it was a simple plate. And it was a simple conversation and a moment that was like, you need to work on this. But had I not had the tool to set a streak, life gets busy. And and I, I know I wouldn't have circled back and I wouldn't have known how to because you feel like it has to be so big. I've got to really do this. And it, and it's hard to define sometimes. And with a streak, it's just the simple thing of keeping it in front of you and, and being intentional. And 80% of the time, it might seem super, super small, but it opens up for the 20% of the time that you're like, we would have never had that conversation if we ha- if I hadn't had that streak yeah. that kept us kind of right. keeping it just simply in front of us. And yeah. so that's yeah. where that's I where love I I love that idea with the streak and, and putting it like on your list of streaks because it's super small, just like all the things you guys advocate for, but making it intentional. And can you imagine the change in your family? I mean, these, these conversations can be as short as two minutes or as long as your family wants to engage with them, but like two minutes a week to have kids who have more confidence to have a family that feels more connected seems so like so worth it so i love the idea of putting this as a streak as something you're going to do once a week and and like you said it's set up perfectly for streaking so right Uh, and it reminds me of a post i think you put out a couple couple weeks ago that you had said that someone sent you a picture of something that you were doing with your kids years ago and it started a conversation where you're like do you remember that we did this and do you remember we did this and they kept saying no we don't remember no we don't remember which for a mom is just crushing because you know it's your you know whole, how much time it's I two spent? things it's how much time i spent and it was like but i was being so fun and you don't remember being me being that way and and so it can be really difficult that they don't remember but it made me one of the points that you made is 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 you said we may not remember everything that's happening but you're opening up the opportunity for those those things that you did with them when they were little developed relationships that opened up opportunities for them to have conversations as teenagers and it reminded me of of something that um a person that i worked with in a youth organization said to me one time where she said they may not ever remember anything you said but they'll always remember how you made them feel and that's really i and i thought that's that same vein is that they may not remember everything that happened but you are creating an environment that opens up and streaking allows for that to have that environment to be open. It's not going to be big most of the time, but it's opening and setting this floor and this foundation 
for things that wouldn't have gone as well if you didn't have it yeah. because you've got this yeah. foundation. Yeah. So. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank for you for your time. Us. So give us just a little bit of, so the uh, the next book coming out in the summer, we've got that. What other, yeah. what anything else you're working on and how can people either follow you or get a hold of you or book you to speak or whatever it is? <laughs> so I am really active in my Instagram community at Brooke Romney Writes on Instagram. It's a great place for parents to be. Um, and then I have both of my first Modern Manners books. They're both on Amazon. And the second one, if you're in Utah, Arizona, or Idaho, is still in Costco. So grab that before Costco says we're done. <laughs> um, and then uh, on my website at brookromney.com, there's a bunch of different ways to contact me if you're interested in speaking engagements or bulk orders or anything like that. Do you have any speaking engagements coming up that you're excited for in the near future? You know, I'm taking a break all through the okay. summer. Okay. Yes, so I'm actually excited idea. for that too. So, oh, good. Well, have like a I'm gonna, I'm gonna be engaged in speaking with my children and my family there you go. this summer. Right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, streakers, um, we've had with us Brooke Romney, and she wrote 52 modern or modern manners for today's teens. Has volume two out there. Is gonna have it for kids. Go out there and buy it, and start setting your streak in order to review this on a, on a deliberate basis. Download the streaking app and put that streak in there. We'll get a community set up uh, with modern manners for teens so that you can adopt a streak if you'd like as well. Uh, if you'd like to ask Jamie or I any questions, you're always welcome to reach out to us, me, Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-E-R-Y, at thestreakingapp.com, or Jamie, J-A-M-I, at thestreakingapp.com. You heard where you can get a hold of Brooke and... I would encourage you to absolutely buy, discuss, and set a streak around her books until we talk again. Keep better you.